Welcome back to Beyond Well. This is a program for people who want to learn more about our interior lives. And every week we tackle another topic that helps add to our mental health toolbox. And recently we partnered with TMS Active Recovery to make sure that you or anyone you know who might be experiencing treatment resistant depression know that there is an FDA approved non-pharmaceutical option for treatment that is covered by most insurances. TMS is short for transcranial magnetic stimulation, and it's helpful for people whose antidepressants have stopped working or those whose side effects from pharmaceutical drugs are just too tough to be able to take medication. I had the great pleasure of meeting a few of the TMS patients, but Todd's story really stood out to me because of just how serious his depression had become before he found TMS. So Todd, when you first began to experience what you now know as depression, what did it feel like? In retrospect, I had depression as a child and I really didn't know that or understand it. But I first became aware that I had depression when I was a young adult. It was the end of uh, Desert Storm, the first Gulf War. And it was after that that I was first diagnosed and first put on medication. And that, that's really when I first uh, did it. And so that was more than 30 years ago. Oh For the most part, early on, medication and therapy and those sort of things really changed my life. And I was well managed on medication for the most part. I had a couple of breakthrough depression, major depression episodes until this last one that I had. It had been 25 years when I got out of graduate school. I had a major depressive episode, but it had really been 25 years. Could you explain what you describe as a major depressive episode, like what it's like in your body and your mind? Yeah, uh, so it is far more than just feeling blue or a little sad. It is really both a mental and physiological experience. For me, it shows up and I just shut down, uh, isolate. I've heard people say it this way. The world goes from being technicolor to being just gray. It's, it's a really a dark place that I find myself in when it's a major depressive episode. And unfortunately for myself, as I think it is for a lot of people, it is a slow slide into it. And then all of a sudden you find yourself there and it's only when you are there in retrospect, you go, oh, this started many months ago. It's not thing that happened for me, it doesn't happen overnight. I know for some folks it, it might, but for me, it, it was a, kind of a slide into it. And what do your friends and family say to you when you're in this state? What do they observe about you? What are they noticing? Well, in my professional world, I think I'm pretty good at keeping up appearances. Although I will say that it shows up for me, sometimes I'm pretty cranky and short and, and I don't show up in the way that I, I like to be. Some folks are like, why are you so irritable? Uh, why are you so annoyed? But with folks that are closest to me, they notice that I don't talk as much that I am very closed off and shut down and isolate. I, I'm an introvert by nature. When I am experiencing particularly this last episode, and again, it had been so long since I'd experienced one, this last episode, I just happy to be by myself, in a room by myself, watching TV or reading or doing pretty much nothing. Did it ever get to the point where you had thoughts of self-harm? Yes. And what was that like? Well, as somebody who works in a mental health field, it is very alarming to me because I'm typically helping others in that state. Finding myself in that position is very unsettling. Fortunately for me, I know kind of what to do and I recognize that as a natural manifestation of the, of the illness, as it were. And so ultimately that is what really pointed me towards seeking treatment. So you have the ability to understand both intellectually what's going on as well as what's happening physically? Yeah, this? I've heard it described as, you know, there can be a thousand miles between the head and the heart. Mm -hmm. And knowing in your head what you need to do and, and feeling it in your heart can be entirely different. The heart knows depression really well. And sometimes trying to get the head to get the heart to do the right thing, it takes a great deal of effort and support. And how frustrating was it for you, given the number of times you've tried antidepressants, that you were at the end of the effectiveness of those drugs? Yeah, so um, it 
The thing that was the most frustrating is when I did decide to take action and that I needed to take action, how sparse and how difficult it was to get assistance from the professional community. In fact, that contributed to my depression getting worse. To try to find a therapist, a psychiatrist, to try to even get into a medical doctor was really hard and I hit lots and lots of barriers with that. And I, as a person who understands the mental health and medical field, I've worked in both of those fields, was very, very difficult. And so it is partially what led me to look into other treatments. And that was how I landed on the magnetic stimulation. So how did you learn about transcranial magnetic stimulation? Well, as a mental health professional, I'd been aware of the treatment for some time, and I was aware of it as it rolled out in Europe. And I had mostly been interested in it or did my initial reading about it as a treatment for PTSD, OCD, and, and anxiety. So I, I don't know what it was, but I came across something that talked about it as being approved in this country around 2008 for depression and for other things. And so I saw that and then I got into the literature around it and looked at uh, some of the most recent studies and things like that. And what was it about the studies or what piece of evidence said to you, yes, I definitely want to try this? Yeah, it was a combination of things. Mostly that which has come out of the Mayo Clinic was really the stuff that resonated the most with me. And I think it was right after that I saw a television program. It was like on Sunday morning or something like that, that they had done a piece on it. But honestly, they called back. So when I started calling around and I called to look into these treatments, they called me back. And so I, I was literally at a place where I felt like I had nothing to lose. And what was the most desperation you felt? The most desperation I felt was when I contacted a clinic, it was through my EAP program. And I was really just looking for a referral to a place. When I gave them my needs and what I was looking for, the message I got back was, your needs are too great. They're too great for us. There's, we really don't have anywhere to refer you. We suggest that you contact your insurance company. And I had already contacted my insurance company and had been given 15 providers. And I called every one of them and not a single one of them had an opening. And I will also say, I chose to take a leave of work from absence because I was so impaired at that point that I just was really struggling to work. Mm -hmm. So I've taken a leave of absence for three months and I'm trying to take care of myself during that time so I can get back. And the whole first month was spent just trying to get services. It felt very, it felt, I was very much in touch with despair at that moment. What were the biggest concerns that you had about TMS? Well, it looks like something out of a 1950s snake oil ad, to be honest. And I think most people would agree with me about that. All you got to do is take a look at the pictures of it, like a hair growth treatment or something. That was really that. Also, in a previous life, I worked in the medical field before I went back to school and changed my careers. And so I worked in anesthesia. So I personally have assisted and done a lot of electroconvulsive therapy. And so I know what that looks like and what that does. I mean, it, it had some reminiscence of electroconvulsive therapy, which is, you know, kind of a big deal. But it also makes a little bit of sense to me too, because they have similar mechanisms of action. Right. So, so that also, I could understand uh, how it would work. So the staff at Active Recovery really helped alleviate your questions and concerns? Yeah, it was good. It was, uh, I mean, I, again, you know, and partly because of my background, I had done a lot of research. So I knew, I knew what was going to happen and, and what to expect. And I was familiar with the mechanism of action, the theory of how it works and all of that. So again, I was, I was open and receptive to whatever because I was, I was desperate. So explain what it feels like in your body, the pulses, the sensation. What is the experience like? It was more uncomfortable than I expected it to be. It took about two weeks of that, but then I accommodated to it and it was fine. I also used the time. It's, uh, you know, 25 minutes or so, 20, 25 minutes. I use that to do mindfulness 
during it. So I could sit there and breathe and I learned how to time my breath to the audible signal that the thing puts out. So I just used it that way. So I just used it as a, as a time to do some breathing. And when you describe it as uncomfortable, would you say it's painful? I would not call it pain as much as I would call it discomfort. And, and some of it is associated with having the twitch that you don't have control over. So having an involuntary muscle movements can feel a little unsettling. Uh -huh. But like I said, you know, you accommod I accommodated to that where it's like, you know, you accept it. And especially after about two and a half weeks, I started feeling physically better. I, I, the, what I noticed first was energy. I started feeling energy again in my body. And because of that, you know, I, I'll, I'll put, I'll put up with a lot. So this energy that you felt, you're contrasting that with what? I just wake up, feel, feel better during the day and just actually feel like I could do things. I had interest in leaving the house, you know, walking the dog, you know, doing those kind of things, which before took a lot of effort. Scheduling and structure. It's like, okay, in five minutes, you're gonna load the dishwasher. You know, I mean, it's that kind of making deals with myself. So what is it like for you to feel this life force come back into you? Yeah, it felt good. I mean, it really felt good. I also had then had the energy to deal with some life stressors that I needed to deal with as well, particularly around my work, but also just, you know, sort of the day-to-day -day navigating pandemic sort of things too, that I was more able to navigate those things just because I had the energy to do it. And how would you describe your change in how you see yourself and how you see the outside world? It just, it, it's sort of like uh, the color came back into it. So earlier I was talking about how the color had kind of drained out of the world and everything was so much effort. It was just like I could, I started to experience a sense of hope again, a sense of kind of can do. I also, uh, and, and one thing not a lot of people talk about uh, depressed people say out loud is one of the things that makes it even more difficult when you're depressed is when you've, you're having your own experience, but you also see the effect that my depressive experience is having on my wife or having on my kids, that sort of thing. Then you get that sort of depressed squared. You, you've got, it's like, ah, not only am I dysfunctional, but my dysfunction is sliding off on these people too. Mm -hmm. So as I started to feel better and get better and do better, they started to see that and feel that as well too. And so I, I started to get better squared as well. You know, That's one of the most profound things, how not only does one have to feel the depression, but they also see how it affects everyone around them. And then that compounds it into depression squared and the overwhelming guilt that you feel. Lots of it. guilt and shame. You have to deal with the shame around that as well. And unfortunately, I think, well, fortunately and unfortunately, fortunately, compared to when I first talked publicly about depression 30 years ago, well, I just was very judicious in that. The public had a, opinions about that that were very shaming, lots of shame around that. And there still is to some degree. I think that's gotten better over the last few years, so, you know, However, there still is stigma attached to it and things like that, but it, but it is much better. And I do see more people speaking out and talking about it. And that's part of the reason I'm here today also is to try to, particularly during the pandemic, I've seen lots and lots of people struggle with mental health and try to keep it completely under wraps. You know, you don't get to recover any kind of illness. I don't care if it's mental illness or physical illness or whatever, you don't get to do that by yourself. You've got to reach out and you've got to, uh, it takes support. I don't want to continue to be in the shadows with it and um, to be as helpful as I can. And part of that is by shining a light on it. So what do you think has changed in your ability to plan for a future life for yourself? You'd said you'd lost the ability to look forward to things. What's life like now? Yeah, so um, it, it really is kind of filled with hope. And, and without a doubt, I've got a lot of challenges. I've got challenges ahead, both personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. However, I feel like I've got more of the tools I need to navigate those challenges and to find my way through that 
just by mere fact that, you know, I've sought treatment and that I'm kind of back to where I was. You know, I'm just really grateful for all of that. I'm taking less meds now than I was, so I don't even have to deal with those side effects. And it's just all together, the future is brighter. What would you say to someone who's listening today who's thinking, wow, I wonder if I should try this? I would say you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. I did not experience side effects. I think that you need to take responsibility for whatever it is that you need. At least in my case, for me it was, I couldn't find a psychiatrist, I couldn't find all of those things that I was looking for. I certainly couldn't get them in the time that I needed to. And so this, such a happy accident that I found this, I'm so glad that I did. So I would say, take that chance and I think you'll be surprised at what it can do for you. Todd, this has been so amazing. Just one more question. If we were going to write a billboard for you about your experience with Active Recovery TMS, what would it say? My name is Todd and Active Recovery TMS changed my life. That's very cool. Thanks for listening to Beyond Well, and thank you, Todd. If you like what you hear today, please give us a thumbs up on Apple Podcasts, which is the only place currently that you can review our podcast, so we'd sure appreciate your input. Bora Health is a nonprofit alcohol and drug treatment center in Portland, Oregon, that has been helping youth, adults, and families for nearly 50 years. They offer compassionate, comprehensive, and affordable care for everyone, regardless of background, orientation, or ability to pay. Fora recently opened a new state-of-the-art campus in Portland's Southeast Gateway District, and the entire campus is healing and supportive. You can find out more about their full array of evidence-based therapies for drug and alcohol treatment at www.forahealth.org. If you or a loved one needs support, there are many options and personalized approaches to care. Reach out to Fora Health at 503-535-1151 or see the show notes for more details.